His speech in the last hour, David Cameron said the Labour leader's comments are ill-judged. It's quite moderate, really. We're joined now by Vernon Coker. He's Labour's, Labour's Shadow Defence Secretary. He's been listening to Ed Miliband's speech at Chatham House in James's Square. He joins us now in the heart of London. Uh, why is Ed Miliband, as we see this unfolding tragedy on the southern shores of the Mediterranean and on the borders of the European Union, why is Ed Miliband saying the Prime Minister has blood on his hands? Well, uh, Ed Miliband isn't uh, saying that the people to blame for the, the migrant crisis are the traffickers themselves. What he's pointing out, though, is that when you take military action, wherever that military action is, whether it's Libya or elsewhere, that an important part of that is, is what you do following that military intervention, the planning that you make for uh, the uh, post-conflict situation, how you support the institutions, how you support the people uh, in uh, that country or that region right. in order for uh, not only uh, there to be a military victory but for the peace to be won as well. But he is laying it at David Cameron's door. The press release from the Labour Party, which was pumped out last night and spun to all the journalists, says Ed Miliband, and this is quoting from it, will say the refugee crisis, what the scenes uh, that we're seeing, the tragic scenes this week in the Mediterranean, which I've already referred to, are in part a direct result of the failure of post-conflict planning for Libya. That's being laid straight at the door of David Cameron and that what is happening in the Mediterranean is in part David Cameron's fault. That's what he's saying. But again, let me repeat, nobody is saying, the, nobody would want to say that the Prime Minister as a human being wants to see the sorts of things that uh, uh, we've seen in the Mediterranean. He'll be as horrified uh, as all of us are. But it is right to point to, uh, Libya is an example, but you can point to other examples, of when you take military action, it is crucial that you actually try and understand what it is that you do in order to stabilise the situation, yep. what you do to try to ensure right. that you win the peace. And that's okay. the point that uh, Ed Miliband was making this that, morning. OK. Uh, Labour supported the intervention in Libya, didn't it? It did. Can you tell me when Mr Miliband then made a speech or requested of the Prime Minister to see the post-conflict planning? He, he, made, uh, he made, certainly when the motion itself was debated, uh, Ed Miliband says in, uh, in, in that debate and in that motion that there is a need for us to be clear about what the, uh, what the planning, sure. uh, uh, the post-conflict uh, And when, post did, and when did he repeat and indeed, that? As it was all going pear-shaped, and it um, went pear-shaped pretty quickly after the intervention stopped, when did he say, where's the post-conflict planning? When did he ask the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's questions? When did he intervene with the speech? Can you point us to Mr Miliband's consistent concern in this issue? Well, certainly uh, at that time, as I've mentioned, and then uh, earlier this year, but I certainly w myself, when, when this year? Uh, as has Douglas Alexander. No, I'm not asking about Mr Miliband. When has, when has Mr Miliband raised this issue? Because we've seen what a disaster it's now, it now is on the ground in Libya. When has the, Prime Min when has the leader of the opposition raised the matter of post-conflict planning? He's raised the issue when the initial motion was passed. You told me that. He when after that? Again, earlier this year. And then when? Between, and then in between that time, he's consistently, he's consistently raised, in between those two particular examples of when, uh, when he's raised it, he's raised consistently the need to ensure that we learn the lessons of, uh, of conflict intervention, that we're ensure... Can we, you tell uh, me, Vernon Coker, can you tell me, when has Mr Miliband to... referred to the lack of post-conflict planning other than today? You, you vaguely say earlier this year, when and in what format? When did he do it last year? He, when he, did he ever refer to it in Prime Minister's questions? Well, he did it in 2011 and certainly he did it earlier this year in February, uh, I believe it was in 2015. He raised those issues, but he's consistently raised the issue of the need for post-conflict planning. Well, you can't give uh, me a single in instance. Situations. You, I'm sorry, Vernon Coker. Well, you, I can't. You cannot give... I'll tell you what he said in 2011, which is about the only time we can work out he said anything on, on this subject. I mean, there's rumours of a party press release in 2013. We can't find it. All he said in 2011 is, this is an important moment to recognise the National Transition Council and their role in taking Libya forward. And we've got to be led by them, not anything to do with post-conflict planning.
Well, as I say, he raised it then and he raised it earlier this year. Exactly. You can't tell me saying, when. And what the speech is saying today. But what the speech is saying, though, today is the I... importance of wherever we become militarily uh, involved, wherever we become involved in conflict, it is really important for us to be engaged, yeah. really important for us to plan for what happens following that okay. intervention. And that's but... the point of the speech that's being made now... uh, today and what we would do if we were in government. Uh, the single biggest group of people at the moment coming across these boat people trying to escape out of the Libyan shores are Syrian. Uh, they're not Libyans. They're coming from sub-Saharan Africa and a big chunk of them are Syria, uh, trying to escape the appalling situation in Syria. Your party voted against intervention in Syria. Could you tell me what Labour's post-non-intervention conflict planning was in Syria? Well, what we said in Syria was, first of all, to, it was important for us to identify uh, in Syria who the groups were that we should, uh, we should support. You were against uh, intervention were and supporting. That, uh, that Can you tell me what we we were... non-intervention planning you did if you're so critical of the government for not doing it? I don't argue with that for a moment, not arguing that it did any great planning, but could you tell me what planning you've done on Syria? What well, we've... Well, in terms of Syria, we've been obviously looking at who we should support uh, in Syria and we've supported because the government uh, have done the right thing. We've supported the government in their efforts to train uh, some of the Syrian opposition outside of Syria in order that they can do that. And we've supported them uh, in that situation. Alongside that, we've been talking to regional partners and listening to what regional partners have to say about how the situation in Syria uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be dealt with. Will people not find it astonishing that a political party that, when in power, presided over the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, two successful invasions, but notable for the lack of post-conflict planning in both places, particularly Iraq, is now lecturing anybody on post-conflict planning? Well, uh, <clears throat> Andrew, we're not trying to lecture people. What we're trying to do is to have a debate about but, and discussion about foreign policy and its links with defence. I understand, but your party's, your party's you record right on post-conflict planning is lamentable. So what right do you have to well, lecture what? this government on its lamentable record of post-conflict planning? Well, I was, going to, I was going to come to the point about Iraq and Afghanistan, but I, as I say, we're not trying to lecture anyone. We're trying to point out the importance of the development of policy to take into account post-conflict planning. Iraq is generally agreed, including by Ed Miliband himself, has said on a number of occasions, and indeed repeated at the Chatham House speech uh, this morning, that there are lessons to be learned from Iraq, in, uh, from Iraq rather, yeah. including uh, the fact that, uh, that post-conflict okay. planning there and reconstruction right. Was, was, in, should have been much better than it was. Uh, uh, Afghanistan, if I might just finish this point, Andrew. Of course. Like, uh, with Afghanistan, I think there was a lot uh, of planning done with respect to what's happened with respect to Afghanistan and a post the withdrawal of troops. And there's certainly been a lot of effort and the, the continued involvement of the UK in Afghanistan to try and build uh, on the military uh, achievements that we had there to sustain the government all there. All right. I, I take your point about the need to learn lessons from post-conflict planning. That's one of the big issues of the past 15 years or so. And of course, one way you learn lessons is by having inquiries into what happened, such as the Chilcot inquiry into Iraq, which is also covering post-conflict planning. So if post-conflict planning is so important to Mr. Miliband this morning, why did he vote four times against a Chilcot-type inquiry as an MP? Well, one of the things that he has said, and you've heard, is that we've said, and indeed Ed Miliband has said recently, that the Chilcot inquiry should be published as soon as possible. No, I'm not, I'm not uh, asking you about that. that. He voted he against Parliament. it four times. If you're so keen to learn the lessons, and nobody can argue that there are not lessons to be learned, Vernon Coker, why would you vote against four times the inquiry where you could actually learn some lessons? Well, as I've said, the, the situation now, Andrew, is that uh, we want the Chilcot inquiry published. Uh, uh, as soon as Cook, I'm not There's asking you about, we're, we're about doing that. that stand way. If you're going to make speeches about the importance of post-conflict planning, which nobody can argue is not a big issue, then surely you need to get to the facts and be in favour of inquiries that will give you the evidence on which you can base future policy. Well, it, absolutely, you need to do that. Absolutely, we need to learn the, the so lessons. So why did he vote against it four happened. times? That's why we've. Well, that's why, that's why we've said that the Chilcot inquiry needs to be published uh, as soon as possible. 
And as I say, the, the speech this morning was all about saying that for all of us, we need now to understand that military intervention on its own is not sufficient. Sure. You do need sometimes to intervene military, I, militarily, but alongside that you need to, uh, can, to, to win the peace as well. Can I just, um, I mean, you, you, you're trying to get away from this that David Cameron's not to blame or that he doesn't have blood in his, fa his hands. Though I, I've put to you what the press release says. Douglas Alexander said this morning that David Cameron, referring to Libya, waded in and then walked away. That seems like blaming him. Well, it's, it, as I say, again, it's, it's not about blaming uh, David Cameron. It's well, not about saying... Well, waded that, in uh, and walked away? To, that sounds to, like blame to me, well, Vernon in terms Coker. Of, well, in terms of... Well, in terms of uh, supporting the military intervention, we supported the military right. intervention. Again, this is, this is a really uh, important uh, uh, discussion, Andrew, and a really important point around this that. issue. Of course we're not trying to... Yeah, exactly. So we're not, it's not about trying to well, say that David Cameron's at fault in a sense of a personal way. It's about saying, however, that once you have military action, that you need then to consider how you build the institutions of that country, yes. how you resolve some of the ongoing but, issues, and what you do about all of those. And that's where we're trying to focus uh, the debate right. and where we're trying to get the debate to. Right, but Veronica, let me put this point to you. Um, if we hadn't in, 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 intervened in Libya, it would probably have fallen apart anyway. We have it, we did intervene and it fell apart. You talk, or your leader talks glibly about this phrase, post-conflict planning. As it was falling apart and warring militias, 1,700 of them now, warring militias turning it into a failed state, two governments now in the country, in Tobruk and Tripoli, the only way that we could have had any influence would have been by a substantial deployment of boots on the ground. And let's just be honest, there is no way that the post-Blairite Miliband party would ever have agreed to any boots on the ground. Can we just be honest? No, I, I mean, we, the, the uh, support for boots on the ground, there wouldn't have been in that situation. But clearly, and I mean, if we remember the circumstances of why the intervention took place okay. in the first place, yeah. uh, it was to prevent a massacre, a threatened massacre, and... Uh, by uh, no, Gaddafi I know of, that. Uh, I understand that. Of, of numerous people in Bingham. I know, I know, but that but, was the reason. I know, I, I know that. That I'm was just... the reason why. Right. But you wouldn't have had boots on the ground, yeah, but, right? Sorry. Well, it, you, no, but we, but okay. we achieved no. uh, what we wanted to do in terms no. of stopping that massacre. I, I, I'm talking about uh, post-conflict. Through the airstrikes and so on. And it, you yes, would exactly, never have but had boots on the I'm just reminding people that's... Well, we wouldn't have had boots on the ground, but how you build the capacity of that country to then support itself to support the, uh, the, the armies and all of those sorts of things that are there, okay. how you bring the various people oh. together. These are the sorts of issues and debates and discussions that need to happen. And we think that have that debate now during okay. the election and for us to consider well, whoever wins the election afterwards is a really important matter. I understand. Just very briefly, finally, you're having this debate less than two weeks before the election. Can you tell me when, as leader of the Labour Party, Mr Miliband last made a major foreign policy speech? Well, he's made a number of statements and speeches to, uh, to Parliament around various military interventions. Right, but can he's you tell me when he last uh, made a major numerous... foreign policy speech in the past five years? Well, he... well, he's made those in Parliament and he's made speeches when he's been uh, in countries uh, visiting Israel, when he's visited Palestine, when he's been no, but a major uh, to, Bri foreign uh, to Washington. Foreign policy speech on British foreign policy, when did he last make a speech on that? Well, as I say, in Parliament he's made a number of speeches with respect to that and statements All with right. respect to that, and similarly uh, but, abroad, but as he... indeed as Douglas Alexander, and I have as well. No, I understand that you, that you have, but I'm still struggling to find Mr Miliband's previous one. But anyway, we'll leave it there, Vernon Coker. Thank you. We're going to speak in a minute okay. to, uh, to William Hague. He